this morning is from the book of 1 Timothy. We're in the sixth chapter. We're looking at verses 6 through uh, 19. One of the interesting things about this text is that uh, many of the phrases and verses will be very familiar to you because they have found their way uh, into the liturgy of the church, into hymnody, and, uh, and into, our, into our theology. Uh, let us listen for God's word as the writer, uh, writer of the epistle talks about social ethics. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, person of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has an power and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good. To be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The Gospel reading this morning is from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. Parable told by Jesus, verses 19 through 31, uh, typically called Lazarus and the rich man. This wasn't uh, the Lazarus who was the uh, brother of uh, Martha and Mary and Jesus raised from the dead. But rather, this is a different Lazarus, a poor man, a beggar. And uh, Christian tradition names the rich man in the story as a person named Dives. I'm going to use that name uh, for simplicity this morning. Note that that is nowhere in the text. He just got named so, somewhere along the line and we've been using it ever since. A few words of introduction uh, to this gospel reading this morning so that we understand it in its larger uh, context. There was uh, an article in the Wall Street Journal this week, a recent psychological study, in which they wanted to find out whether or not facts had anything to do with what you and I believe. In other words, they wanted to find out if you are presented with things that are just, they just are, whether or not you can change your opinion about religion, politics, Whatever. Well, rather depressingly, <laughs> they discovered that facts really have no impact on uh, what we think. In fact, they found that what we tend to do is we tend to bend facts toward what we already think. And we see this, of course, uh, in our very polarized politics. Today. Let me give you an example of how this plays out in the church, and every pastor is very familiar with this. 
I remember a number of years ago, I preached uh, what I knew to be a very theologically sound, a painfully exegeted uh, text um, uh, that was, uh, you know, just in the broad mainstream of, of Christian uh, thinking for 2,000 years. When I was shaking hands with people at the door, one woman was crying, and then the person behind her gave me a lecture on how I ought to learn something about the Bible and theology. <laughs> we tend to bend facts to what we already think. We do this, of course, with regard uh, to our own incomes and to the economy at large. Let me share with you some facts with the hope that maybe some of you will bend facts to what you think. The current minimum wage in this country has the purchasing power that it did in 1967. Now I can already see the wheels turning in your head, depending on what you already think about what you're going to do with that. I already know. The current unemployment rate at 7% means that there are three people applying for every job that is available. Okay? I already know what you're doing with that one, too. Social mobility, whether or not you're able to improve your economic standing, social mobility in industrial countries, the major industrial countries, the United States ranks at the bottom. Now, I already know what you're doing with that one, too. Do you know which countries rank at the top? The Scandinavian countries. I already know what you're doing with that one, too. Food stamp fraud. We've heard a lot about this lately. Remember, you know, all the stories we've heard about welfare queens, people buying steak dinners with their food stamps. Well, you know, this has been studied exhaustively. The fraud in the food stamp program, SNAP is what it's called is less than 1%. And yet these myths about people abusing the system continue. Let me share just a couple of other ones. Um, CEO pay in the United States is 400 times what the average worker makes. In most other countries, it's only 40 times. Why is that? Is it the natural order of things? Catholic Charities is the largest religious organization helping the poor in this country. They receive 70% of their funding from the federal government. It's estimated that if the churches were to take over all of the feeding of the poor in this country, each church would have to raise an additional $50,000 year, per year to cover the do you think most churches have an extra $50,000 laying around to do this? Very interesting. All right. Let's read the story of Lazarus and Dives. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus is my man, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. 
and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And this is the word of the Lord. You know, many uh, churches in the congregational tradition, broader reform tradition, have boards of deacons who are commissioned with uh, primarily meeting the needs of the poor. And I think this church, uh, and it's not too distant past, had a board of deacons as well. Well, let me tell you a story about one church that had a board of deacons and their, their work. The deacons of this particular church, it was a, was a well-off parish, announced that they would give grocery vouchers to strangers who dropped by the church office. Vouchers could be used for food, but were not valid for alcohol, lottery tickets, or tobacco. The congregation was thrilled. Cash handouts, after all, were making them uncomfortable. No one wanted to see his or her greenbacks plunked down at a, at a liquor store, for instance. No one wanted to be some kind of an enabler. But no one wanted to refuse assistance either, and here was a a way that they felt that they could really offer genuine help. Now the Dickens, of course, were trying to be proved. As most urban pastors will, will tell you, meeting strangers who drop by their offices, they want money. But odds are they'll, uh, you know, guzzle or gamble, whatever they may get. So if vouchers nudged even one of them toward leafy green vegetables, the congregation should feel good about its ministry. After all, it's, it's bad stewardship to waste cash on con artists. It's worse to harm people by supporting addictions. The deacons acted with good intentions and optimistically. It was in their mind the thing to do. But here's the rub. I can't help feeling that it was rather unseemly for them to be so darn happy, tickled, proud of themselves about this scheme. Privileged people, and I don't mean just the well-to-do, should, I think, resist slipping into the habit of self-congratulation. You see, whenever resources shape the moral terrain and choose the terms of compassion toward the less fortunate, we might at least have the good sense to be a little embarrassed, a little humble. We ought to do what we think is best, but I think we ought to do it kneeling. Let's take a look at our story this morning. Lazarus was indeed one beggar who really could have used a voucher. He was starving, he was lusting after dives, garbage. Unfortunately, Luke's parable, though, lacks the sort of data that people like to have when deciding whether and how to help. It doesn't say, for example, if Lazarus was deserving or lazy, drug addicted, or mentally ill, or a, or a good Joe who's just down on his luck. We don't know whether he cornered dives with pathetic spiels every time he left the house, or whether he just lay there annoyingly mute day after day. All we know is that he was at the gate, that he was sick and hungry, and that Luke seems to say that's all we really need to know to predict the reversal ahead. Well, there aren't too many details about dives either. Uh, we come with questions like, did he invite friends over to laugh and point at Lazarus? Did he have his goons lean on Lazarus to scare him off? Did he gag at the sight of the dogs licking his swords? We don't know whether he was a, a cold man who habitually averted his eyes, who, who never saw the, the beggar at all, or whether he did notice maybe 
said a prayer for such a sorry case, but stuck to his policy of never giving anything directly to street people. We know only that he was rich, that he dressed well, and that he ain't ate sumptuously. And that, Luke says, is all we need to know to predict the great reversal ahead. You know, anyone who reads the Gospels half awake is not shocked by this incredible reversal. Jesus, you'll know, is unnervingly repetitious about the moral risks that the wealthy run. And it's a very countercultural message. It was in his time as it is in ours. Finally, in week 18, the, the disciples become so exasperated with Jesus. They ask him, they say, but if what you say is true, how, how then can the rich be saved? There's something else in the Lazarus story that seems odd as well. Dives up to his neck in flames, and the story hasn't figured out that the reversal is for real and for good. There's no way out even. Of course, it's not lost on dives that he's suffering, nor that his fortune and his fine Egyptian underwear have literally been shot to hell. Surely he's sorry now that he's failed to do right by that beggar. But even unspeakable retribution has not undone the self beguilement that makes it easy to sin. His wherewithal is gone, but its stubborn residue remains unconscious entitlement, reflex self-assertion, and ridiculous in the circumstances, a blind optimism, privilege, even in these dire circumstances, claims to dives, even in hell. Send Lazarus to me, he pleads. Now, it's not an idle line. It betrays habits of control. Dive still believes remarkably that he can command and expect a response. His obdurate assumptions about what's best and who deserves what have made him insensible to his situation. He continues to locate himself and others in the old geography of earned or innate word. Lazarus, you see, is a man he should have helped, but it still wouldn't be wise to give him cash. You see, if he dies, Lazarus is simply a servant. You can send for him with a curt command and fresh, a damned but nonetheless an important person do because he is who he is, ought not to suffer even now, the unrelenting thirst of the unassisted poor. You can send him off to, to warn heedless brothers about the fate they're for him. It's never too late. God wouldn't be so cruel. A wink of the eye and exception for the folks of the network. But Abraham in the story snatches this illusion. His reply is terrible and true. Some outcomes cannot be influenced. Some chasms cannot be crossed. Some things harder. There's a point of no return. Even Abraham cuts no ice with a God determined to be just. Ask yourself, how then can the privilege be saved? Luke has nothing new to say. We have Moses and prophets and spirit to fix our hearts and minds on Jesus who lives. We too can listen to them. I want you to think about all of this in terms of a man I read about recently. He's a man named Ron Shaich. He's the founder and CEO of Panera Bread. You may have seen his article as well. Ron Sage recently participated in a, a novel program to better understand poverty. He agreed to live on $4.50 a day, which is what people receive under the SNAP program. It's called the SNAP Challenge. You've probably seen a number of CEOs doing this recently. SNAP, you'll recall, is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, previously known as food stamps, which literally helped millions of Americans who are living in poverty, about 40 million people, uh, the largest number of people in poverty in the developed world, by the way. Shage has seen thousands of people who struggle to feed themselves and their families. He's visited dozens of soup kitchens and food pantries and homeless shelters and food banks. He's worked closely with nonprofit organizations. However, in his own words, he said, I had no clue how difficult it was to survive 
like the people he had witnessed. His snap challenge taught him that merely observing someone else's plight does not hold a candle to consciously altering your habits to better understand what it might be like to live someone else's life. Under this challenge, he lived on a food and beverage budget of $4.50 a day, which is the average amount a recipient of food stamps gets in benefits. He quickly saw the reality of being hungry. Shaich was forced to monitor how much food was left in the fridge and how many dollars were left in his wallet. He admits eating portions that were too big and wasn't sure what to do if his food ran out. And this caused him a great deal of anxiety and uncertainty. He saw the trials of feeding himself on such a minimal amount. 80% of households that had problems putting food on the table include the most vulnerable members of our society. The majority of these people are children and then a close second of the elderly and the disabled. In this challenge, Shaich had to quickly change everything about his daily life. He had, for instance, toasted oats for breakfast and snacks. Lunch and dinner varied between chickpea, jalapeno, and tomato soup, lentil casserole, and pasta with tomato sauce and garlic. He only drank water and gave up coffee because it didn't fit within his budget. Luxuries such as fresh fruit and vegetables and yogurt were too expensive. Shaich said his new diet made him listless and grumpy. The sad reality is that one in six people in our society, roughly 48 million Americans, face this tragedy daily. Unlike the challenges of many Americans living off this diet, Shaich admits that he wasn't worried about his car breaking down or not being able to pay for gas, or having his electricity cut off, or finding work, or paying an unforeseen medical bill. But for our fellow Americans, the reality is, it is about whether or not to eat, or to buy heart medicine, or diabetic drugs. As Sheikh says, it's not about whether or not food is boring, it's simply about living. You know, the debate we often hear in Washington and even here in Topeka leads to thinking that the issue can be seen in simple black and white terms, right and wrong, good or bad, and in this way we're able to dismiss it as being simple. But in this discussion, Shaich acknowledges critics of the program too by saying that he has no doubt that there are a very small number of people who accept SNAP benefits when they either don't need the assistance or may not use them appropriately. And as I said before, it's about 1% or less. However, says Sage, this can be seen with any large or complex system <coughs> such as SNAP. In closing, Sage recognizes that government is only a part of the solution, and he challenges his corporate allies to address this complex problem as well. At Panera, the company has tried to stretch itself to think of how to address hunger in new ways, new ways, and so they're experimenting. You may have seen some information about this recently as well. They've started five nonprofit restaurants called Panera Cares. These are community cafes that have no set price. You can just go in and pay uh, either what you have or what you think the meal costs. And they've also donated hundreds of millions of dollars in products to food banks. You see, Panera firmly believes that we must take care of the world that we live in or there won't be any society left for us to support. Hunger exists at Sage in every community, in every county, in every state. And he concludes with these very profound words. This is our problem to solve and it's time to do so. It's time for more Americans to recognize this problem and to take a proactive approach in helping our fellow citizens. This can and must be a public-private partnership with government, private industry, the faith community, and all others working to help the least among us. As our text says this morning, Abraham, Moses, the prophets, Jesus, the 2,000-year witness of the church, all say the same thing. Let us
Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we disconcertedly find ourselves living in a society of want. Of course, it's always been that way. But we've been shocked at the diminishment of what we've been proud of for so long in the middle class. It has shaken the foundations of who we understand ourselves to be. And it has challenged the notion of who we are as a people. The Lord, help us to understand that when we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, we're simply asking that our basic needs be met and that we ought to be content with that. What a different world it would be if everyone had their basic needs. Lord, help us as your people to make that a reality. We ask you.